Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm Christina Hernan. My Twitter handle is at Emed Talks, and I'm truly grateful and humbled to be here today. I'm going to apologize right up front for this, and I'll explain a little bit later. Three years ago, I had an experience which changed my view of the world, and I've come here to share some of my ideas with you. Despite our incredible knowledge in EMS and disaster response, there's actually a very small gap in a sort of a little gap inside of it that affects everything related to disaster response. It is a gap in knowledge, in understanding, in safety, in preparation, and it truly most affects some people that are on the ground at the time of any particular major incident. So we need new words and new vocabulary in order to describe this gap and to describe these people. But I know this doesn't make sense to you yet. And in order for this to make sense to you, I need to ask two things of you. First, I want you to temporarily put down anything you think you know or understand about disaster response or that you've learned so far. And second, I'm hoping that you'll indulge me as I ask you to jump into this story and try to experience it from the inside out in order to get a view of what I had a view of so that you might understand differently rescuers on the scene. The time, place, and circumstances of this allegory are actually irrelevant. Um, these things happen for many reasons in many places and many times, and the incidents in Orlando this week really make this discussion quite poignant. What follows could be a triggering discussion for a few of you if you've ever been through a truly traumatic situation up close and personally. And if at any time during this presentation where you'll be hearing some very visual and sensory descriptions of my experience and now your experience, you decide you don't want to be here, I will not be offended if you decide to leave. In fact, I understand. Okay, let's begin. Are you ready? Are you really ready? As we start, I want you to try to get fully present in this room. So without conversation, if you would, just for a few moments, stand up. Stand up and look around the room. I want you to make contact with other people's eyes. I want you to notice the corners of the room. I want you to notice what's in this room, what, what kind of things are here. Is there a scent? Do you still have a taste in your mouth? How do your shoes feel on your feet? How do your feet feel on the floor? Have you noticed yet the hum and quiet whisper of the ventilation system? Okay, take a seat. This story could happen anywhere, but in today's version, it happens here. If you'd like, close your eyes for about 10 seconds and just kind of listen to the words. You are at an international conference in a cosmopolitan city having a wonderful day, the kind of day that keeps you going truly for the next year, a rejuvenating day, when all of a sudden you hear a very loud noise that sounds like an explosion. You feel it in your feet and in your chest just a tiny little bit, and a few seconds later you feel a blast of air brush across your cheek. You think you have no idea what it is, but then you hear it again. And you find yourself thinking about your colleague who spent 18 months in the Baghdad Emergency Department and a story that he once told you about hearing explosions outside and wondering how close they are to you. A few moments later, an announcement is made. We have just confirmed that two explosions went off on the street outside. One blew out the side of the building. Please prepare to receive potential casualties. Now listen to the fire alarm sounding in the distance. For a couple minutes, you look around and gather anything which seems useful. You look through your bag, you look at other people's belongings. A few of you go over to the exhibition forum to see if there are any medical supplies available there. And while you're doing that, an announcement is made. Any available medical help, please report to the street on the riverside. You think to yourself, they're doing it wrong. They shouldn't be sending potential rescuers to the scene. But at the same time, you simultaneously think it kind of makes sense because what the hell else are you supposed to be doing? And where's the next explosion going to happen anyways? You start to travel towards the street. And as you walk towards the smoke and the people are running towards you, you see the first media arrive, and they're tracking you with their cameras. 
You brace yourself. You mentally brace yourself, for you're not really sure what you're about to see. And you hold your stethoscope close to your chest. You've started taking it everywhere with you when you travel, because it lends you credibility and gives you confidence. And now it strikes your chest like a heartbeat with each step. As you move towards the commotion, your chest starts to ache as you encounter a confronting visual that assaults your eyes and hurts. Three people are running at you almost full speed. They're pushing a wheeled chair, and in the chair sits a victim with two extremities blown off. The hair is singed. Their color is so ashen gray. The vessels, fascia, tendons, vessels again, are flapping in the breeze with the speed that they are pushing this chair. The chattering of the wheels <laughs> rattles in your head as you can see that he is in the pursuit for his life against death, and it's close on his tails. As you near the scene, a firefighter is urging you on. Come on, this way, Doc, this way. Come on further, hurry. You take a few steps further, closer to the smoke, towards the people running towards you. There's another firefighter, and he says, come on, Doc, this way, inside, there are people inside. And he's indicating to you a storefront where the facade has been blown out and smoke is billowing out onto the street. The fire alarms, you hear them again. At this point, they're penetrating your mind. They're the loud ones, the institutional ones. <laughs> they're unrelenting. Your foot suddenly slips, so look down. You are standing in a pool of coagulating blood. Shards of glass are everywhere. Tattered shoes, clothing, bags, and pieces of toes surround you. You notice how vibrant the colors are. The sun is glistening, the bright red blood, the blue sky, the brightly colored clothing, and your brain declares to you, how beautiful. And you are absolutely disgusted with yourself as you realize you just had a completely inappropriate thought. The almost fall has awoken your senses, and you stand very still and think. Don't fall. There's biohazard and glass everywhere. What if it were a dirty bomb? There could be radiation right now. Well, I guess it is what it is. I'm already here. Time distancing and shielding will help me, so don't stay here too long. The smoke. Smoke inhalation's bad. So you take a deep breath through your nose first. And then through your mouth. It's not too bad, maybe just a little bit irritating. It's probably not that dangerous. And the stench of the acrid sulfur, smoke, burning plastics, and burning flesh penetrates your nose and your brain. You see patients everywhere, and you carefully move forward. You step into the store over the threshold and over a woman with a coat hanger impaled in her thigh. She has a pressure bandage applied that's been made from a t-shirt, and it seems to be doing a reasonably good job. You look around the store to see several other patients. They all have tourniquets applied, mostly to legs, a few to their arms, that have been made from belts and t-shirts from the store and from people's waists. You realize that these patients have actually been kind of stabilized, and you alone are incapable of moving them or transporting them out of there, so you go back out to the street to see if you can be of any help there. There are no triage tags yet. You have a marker, though, and someone asks you if you would start writing triage numbers on people's foreheads, old school, until the triage tags arrive. So you do that for a few patients, and you are fascinated as you realize that this critically injured level one patient is now actually a level two, because that makeshift tourniquet's kind of doing okay, and he probably could go a few hours. And besides, that first patient really reset your standard for what a level one is. Ambulances are arriving, but there are hundreds of patients, and you anticipate that the conference center lobby will probably be a collection point, so you head back there. And as you arrive, you see the patients all crisscrossed all over the place, all in one small area, all triage levels, people that aren't even injured, everyone's sitting there, and on the side, there's a tablecloth covering a body, and you cannot take your eyes off of it. In fact, nobody can take their eyes off of it. It's so sad, and it's so distracting. And then you think, I wonder if the bad guys put a bomb in here, because I've seen on TV that you really should explode the rescuers, and if they knew this were this kind of conference, and we were a bunch of medical people, well, this would be a target, and am I safe here? 
you look down as you start to walk the perimeter of the area. You're trying to get a lay of the surroundings to figure out what's going on here. Where's triage? Where should triage be? Your mind is racing with all of the disaster training you've already had. But as you start to walk, you start to slow down, and everything's in slow motion all of a sudden, and your feet are so heavy, you can't even get it off the floor until you're still. And as you're looking down, you hear white noise. Everything else disappears, and you just hear this <sighs> Nothing's moving. That's the only sound you hear. And your vision is incredible. You can see every single little nook and cranny of the asphalt pavement, but every little bump like this looks like it's two inches tall, like little spiky mountains, and you can't move. And the nausea starts to climb out of your stomach, and it's out of your stomach and into your chest, and coming up into your neck. And right when it's there, you hear your own voice in your own head, and it asks, what's wrong? And as you try to think about what's wrong, it rises further, and you feel the nausea at the back of your throat, the taste just starting to come forward. And again, you hear your own voice answer, and it says, quite calmly, I might die today. And instantly, the nausea recedes, everything comes back up to full speed, the hearing is normal, everything seems fine, and you can actually feel the palpable moment when you just went into autopilot. You feel the change. You text your family, I'm okay, not even realizing that they had already texted you first. You walk the perimeter and you find another patient off to the side, critically injured, who really can't be over there because the ambulances are plucking patients from over there, and you get frustrated. You orchestrate some people to move that patient closer to the pile of patients so he can be over there, and as you get back to the pile of patients, you grow increasingly frustrated at the crisscross, mishmash, lack of triage mess that's going on because people are gonna die if they pluck the wrong patient out of that. So you take your marker and you grab any silly thing that you can find and you start writing and you make the first sign. Triage one, most serious. Next sign, triage two, less serious. Next sign, M-O-R-G-U-E. And you ask somebody tall to pin those signs up for you. And then you go to the announcer and you say, can you announce this for me? Morgue, over there in the other room, triage one on the left, triage two on the right, triage three in the back, and you don't bother making a triage three sign because you can't believe that you are a critical care specialist wasting your time drawing on curtains for stupid signs that aren't even your responsibility anyways. The pile of patients is there. You assign somebody with you to grab a pair of EMS shears and start cutting, cutting off clothing alongside you. They cut off the clothing, you quickly do an exam, you look at the back, the chest, the abdomen. For any hidden trauma or any deterioration, you check a radial pulse and a quick assessment of mental status. You go from patient to patient making eye contact every single time, introducing yourself. You probably care for 20 to 25 people. You are then interrupted by an announcement. Another device was found across the street just outside this building. And there will be a controlled detonation in five, four, three, two, one. You flinch just before the countdown is over and shudder deeply when the loudest explosion of all shakes your resilience as much as it shakes your body. The scene dwindles down and another announcement is made asking you to leave the area so the bomb-sniffing dogs can sweep the region. You did not think you could feel any less safe, but you do. You head for the door, and your first foot crosses the threshold just fine, just like you're walking. But the very second your second foot hits the ground, you're stuck again. You look forward, there's kind of a relative obstruction in front of you. You look to the left, there's a cop motioning, no! Not that way. You look the other direction, there's another cop, no! Not quite as frantic, I guess I'll go that way. The person behind you bumps into you because you've stopped so suddenly. You turn around to look at them and say, or maybe it's more of an ask, I don't know which way safe is. There's no answer to your query, and so you force yourself to walk. With a few others, you start walking in a direction. I don't know which direction, just any direction. It seems safer. And you find yourself heading to an available open restaurant. As you walk in, you're not feeling hunger, just emptiness. There's a hostess. They kind of startle for a second as they see you, 
and then exude kindness and warmth as they lead you to a table. As you pick and sweep around and take a few bites of the food, you realize your leg is cold. So look down. And you see there's blood on your leg, and another surge of nausea comes as you realize why that hostess startled when she first saw you. Your family comes to pick you up, and you have never felt so relieved to receive their love. Once home, you shower for over an hour, trying to get the stench of smoke and burnt flesh out of your nose, and it will not go. Exhaustion gives way to self-doubt and near self-hatred as you perseverate on three thoughts. Did I do enough? Did I make a difference? And did I do the right thing? And you're pretty sure that no, no, you certainly did not because you're a critical care expert, so-called, and all you did was remove clothing, check some pulses, and take a marker and make some drapes. The whole city is overwhelmed, and there's a massive effort for community-wide counseling and support, and you hear an announcement that there's gonna be an open forum counseling session for all comers at a local hotel auditorium, but you immediately realize that you absolutely cannot go to that session because what you need to talk about is burnt flesh, toes on the pavement, and flapping shards of flesh and blood when people are gonna die. Anything that you have to say will traumatize the people in that room. You are absolutely drowning in the acute stress reaction, and you feel so, so ashamed for not doing anything. While others get debriefing within 24 hours, the hospital personnel, police, fire, ambulance, you go for days with nothing offered, longing to reconnect with the others that were here with you the same day, that did the same things you did, that saw the same things you saw, that smelled the same things you smelled. Auditory and visual intrusions interrupt every thought and prevent sleep. Your madness turns to anger and near complete desperation as you plead for someone to help you, help you to get some kind of counseling or debriefing like has helped you before after a gruesome call. But you are invisible here because you don't work for the local hospital and you don't work for the local first responder agencies. An angel of a colleague helps you set up a debriefing and you cobble together as many of the other people like you as you can find. But really these people are from all over the place so it's kind of hard to find. One week after the incident, 41 people come to your debriefing. Several have not slept. There are a few that have not spoken a single word about what they saw or experienced to anyone. But 41 out of 41 said the same three phrases, usually two or three of them. Did I do enough? Did I make a difference? And did I do the right thing? You accept your self-doubt as normal as you hear how their pain mirrors yours. You're taught that you're all victims of an explosion and to be kind with yourselves. You learn that a warrior is not ashamed of her scars. I am not ashamed of my scars, including needing to use notes because I realize I can't talk about this without getting blindsided and sidetracked. After that, I went home and I started to heal. This is my story. I was a volunteer physician for the, an athletic organization at the Boston Marathon bombings. I started in the finish line tent, heard and felt the explosions, went out to the street uh, as directed, and was it right in the blood and glass and everything else that I described. I don't remember a single face of anyone I cared for that day, and I had an unmovable pair of shoes in my bathroom for nearly nine months before I could touch them in order to throw them out. The day was challenging, but the week following was far worse. The self-doubt and failure was destroying me until I felt 41 other people that felt the same way. I felt betrayed, overlooked, and I had nobody to mad at, be mad at because everything I'd learned really didn't include a category like me. At first, I thought it was just because we were medical people, not part of a first responder agency, but six months later, I met a restaurant owner. That's me on the same day in the morning and an accidental selfie. Strange how it happened, but that's how I looked afterwards. I met a restaurant owner. He told me that he, his waiters, all had taken their belts off, gone out into the street, tied them around strangers' legs. I said, I knew you were out there. How are you doing? He said, I still can't sleep. 
Every night I think, did I do enough? Did I make a difference? And did I, did I do the right thing? His words struck me like a brick and I realized we are all the same. I told him I knew exactly how he felt, that he'd made a difference, that he'd done enough, and that I knew exactly how bad it was and for sure he had made a difference. I watched as the tears welled in his eyes and six months of pain and exhaustion started to fall off of his shoulders. I truly hope he went home and slept that night. In that moment, I realized it does not matter what your training is. When your arm's been torn off amidst multiple people, all you need is for someone, anyone, to see you to go over and to try to help, including using makeshift tourniquets. Because until everyone has a tourniquet in their pocket, there's going to be a need for people to make makeshift tourniquets from whatever they have available. If you're entrapped in a fire and someone pulls you away, that person's your hero. But that immediately available person de facto experienced that tragedy right along with you and might be compromised by their experiences. They did their best to keep you alive amidst really challenging circumstances in a potentially unsafe scene. These are immediate responders. That's the word I'm trying to create. And they've been present right in front of us for all of time, doing their best in the disaster gap. You might think that's a bystander, but don't call me a bystander because I went home with blood on my pants and nightmares. My brother was up the street, not involved with patients. I would consider him a bystander. Some of you will think, nah, you were a physician, you had medical responsibilities, you're a first responder. But as you just see, saw, if you're not part of that specific first responder agency, you slip through the cracks. First responders are special because they bring intention, a clear head, equipment, resources to restore safety and security to these events. They deserve the best training and supplies, and we try to provide that for them. And it's as it should be. But before they arrive, the only people available are immediate responders who are there when the event goes down in this time period of the disaster gap from the moment of the incident through phone calls to help until clear-headed people come. It's a definable time period. There's an already existing cohort of people. They're already there. They've been there for all of time. It's as if you take a slice of society in any moment. In this forum, we'd be full of medical providers. If you did a random slice of society on the street, fewer would be trained, but people would all have the same confrontation of bleeding to be stopped and to try to do the best they can, at risk of getting really visual uh, symptoms, psychological symptoms, even physical risks such as radiation or anthrax exposure or whatever from being at the scene. Right now, we know virtually nothing about this time period and the impromptu rescuers. We do nothing to maps maximize preparation, safety. We don't know their impact on patients, and we don't know about their recovery. Our blindness is so prevalent, we don't even see it when it's in front of us. All of our CPR classes start with, is the scene safe? The answers are yes, no, and I don't know. We only teach our students how to proceed once the scene is safe. They're supposed to wait until the scene is safe. Every CPR class needs to include how to try to be safe in an unsafe scene. If I might have convinced you that these concepts exist, additional responsibilities come along. First, the CPR one. Next, try to define the minimum essential curriculum. You could have a consensus conference, bring all the right players in. What's the minimum thing people need to know in order to be ready in this situation? I think it looks like this. Shit can happen anywhere. You might be there. It might be dangerous. Here's how to try to be safe. Don't move, move patients unless you have to. If you have to, here's how. Hemorrhage control. You're going to have a stress reaction, probably. Here's how to get help. Maybe airway opening, maybe. I think the consensus conference of experts can try to determine this curriculum. I think first responders need to know that although antics of bystanders are fun to make fun of, that some of those bystanders may actually be immediate responders, traumatized, and maybe need to be considered slightly more like a victim themselves. They also are able to anticipate the actions of bystanders, of immediate responders, and even carry that forward to figure out where are they going to bring the patients, what care have they provided, do I need to modify their care, is their care compromised? Reach out to immediate responders the way we reach out to first responders, help them connect and process. There's no resource right now to find people like me, the, store, the shop owner, the store owner, the people on the street. What I've just told you is deeply personal to me, and I truly believe that it is important. I hope you might consider the following. Use these words and teach others about them. From this day forward, teach your students about how to be safe in an unsafe scene. When possible, update your lectures or textbooks to include some of these concepts, if you agree. And consider joining me in developing a disaster gap research and education group. And I'm running out of time very quickly. And it, I'd like to thank Rob Rogers, though, 
for introducing me to the term personal tragedy crusade, which I heard on his podcast from his lecture last year in Chicago. It gave both validity and teeth to what I had been doing and feeling and I describe as my personal passion project. Thank you so much for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina. That was, that was truly a powerful and evocative story of, of a very incredibly difficult time. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. You don't have to do that. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. I think we've got time just for a single question. Thanks. MJ, anything you've got uh, from Twitter? Obviously, lots has come through, but um, is there any question you... Yeah, wow. I summarize? feel I need a moment after that. Um, I think you've transported us all with you into a situation where I think it was very powerful that what you said, you were not a bystander, you were not a well-equipped first responder, but you were also not a critical care physician. You, went, you were a impromptu rescuer, and you were part of the people being affected by this. And thank you again for sharing this. I think there's just a lot of admiration that's come through on Twitter for your, your being brave and come and sharing it with us. Um, there were just a few questions uh, and comments maybe, and uh, John Paul said, um, he was wondering if uh, you found debrief helpful and whether you think there's a, a risk, uh, in your opinion, that this might increase PTSD. A uh, really valid and controversial question. I think there are sort of two versions of the word debriefing. There's a formal Mitchell model, multiple step debriefing. That is the debriefing I went through and it's one I've been through in the past mm -hmm. that has helped me get through rough times in medicine and it is of value to me. But I do appreciate the controversy and that it's been well documented to show harm in certain people. It shows harm in victims when you ask them to relive their experiences when they don't want to. It shows harm in, in first responders when you force them to attend. But I think adults, or, and maybe children, I don't know, but I think adults are able to self-select for what they needed. And I knew exactly what I needed. I needed to talk to the people that I didn't have to explain anything to. I needed to talk to the people that were there, understood how bad it was, and I didn't have to describe the detail that I just described to you because they already knew what I felt like. And in hindsight, um, having gone through this experience, do you think there's anything any of us could do to prepare ourselves if we ever find ourselves in a situation like that. I mean, you can read all the textbooks on disaster management, but when you're emerged in that, is there anything we can do to prepare ourselves for? Um, I, I think when I finally decided to like put a stamp and put a word on my concept of that sort of person that's slipping through the cracks in the middle is when I decided that I can't define a course. There's not one course because this is too big. It affects mental health, police, fire, EMS, public health exposures. It's too broad. And who am I to define what it means to these other groups? Mm -hmm. But I think if you define the vocabulary and say there's a period of time we're not paying attention to and there's a group of people we're not paying attention to, then each of those fields will naturally take it where it needs to go. And as a secondary result, I think it builds community, not only preparedness by being aware that this stuff can happen anywhere mm -hmm. and learning a minimum of how to be safe and maybe hemorrhage control mm -hmm. and stress reaction would be enough to get a huge community of people through. And then it also builds recovery because they have, I, as soon as I knew that my reaction was normal, I went home, I slept. So I think it's, it's really developing the idea brings other benefits. Fantastic and thank you again for sharing that. Thanks. So round of applause. Thank you, Christina.